everybody. My name is Virginia Flaherty. I'm a rehabilitation technician at Pacific Wildlife Care, and I am also a volunteer on the educational team for Pacific Wildlife Care, bringing out our am educational ambassadors. And I wanted to talk a little bit about Pacific Wildlife Care today. We are the only licensed rehabilitation facility in San Luis Obispo County for wildlife. We take in about 76% birds, and we take in about 23% land and air mammals and about 1% reptiles and amphibians. Um, in 2019, we took in 2,613 animals. That's quite a, quite a lot. And so far in 2020, we have over 2,350 animals that we have taken into care here in our facility. If you ever find an injured orphan or sick animal, a wild animal out there, give us a call. We have a hotline that's great. You can leave a message and we have volunteers who will call you back. The number is 805-543-WILD, W-I-L-D. Uh, welcome to day two of our, thank you, Wild at Heart at Home. Um, we're excited to share a little bit about coastal birds today. Um, birds are the largest part of the number of animals that we take in here at Pacific Wildlife Care. So about 30% of our uh, birds are coastal birds. And when I say coastal birds, what I'm talking about are pelagic birds, those birds that live exclusively on the water, in the water for the majority of their life, and then semi-aquatic birds. So um, think about things like pelicans or cormorants or gulls. Um, for the pelagic birds, we take in a lot of loons and grebes and common murs, things like that. Um, the top species that we admit here in that group are brants, cormorants, brown pelicans, western gulls, California gulls. We take a lot of western and Clark's grebes in here at the center. Also a lot of mallards, red-throated loons have been very common. And for us, most of our bird intakes, coastal bird intakes, are in the fall and winter. And that's because here in Morro Bay, that's when most of our, our birds fly in to migrate and spend the winter here. So we get a lot of ducks and geese here in the winter, a lot of grebes and a lot of loons that come in here all winter long. Some of the cool things about pelagic birds, which also make them very challenging for us to rehab them here, is that they, um, because they live their whole lives in water, we have to keep them in water as much as we possibly can. They can't be sitting on a hard surface because they will um, develop what are, are called keel sores. So essentially like a bed sore, if you spend too much time in bed, they will get the same thing. So as soon as we get a pelagic bird in here, the first thing we do after doing an exam is get that bird into water so that we can avoid having those problems with them. We get a lot of what we call crash landers, and these are birds, especially loons and grebes, that are migrating here to the area, and they look down and they see a nice green expanse or a dark expanse, and they think it's water, and they land in it, and unfortunately it's a lawn or a tennis court or a parking lot or something like that. And their way their body is, um, is designed, so to speak, they have legs that are set way back at the back of their bodies and they aren't able to take off unless they're actually on water. So they're stuck there unless somebody comes and picks them up and brings them into us. And very often there's nothing major wrong with them. We feed them up and get them kind of taken care of for a few days and we can release them. So that's the ideal. Um, I wanna to talk to you about our raffle, very exciting. Um, following this wildlife presentation, we'll be selling raffle tickets, $5 each or six for $20 for a chance to win a really amazing prize. Thanks very much for joining us today. Next up, Jerry Roberts is going to bring out one of our birds who is a local predator who hunts very, very close to the water um, around and on coastal birds. So you'll be seeing that bird coming up next. Hello, my name's Jerry and I'm with Pacific Wildlife Care and I do educational outreach. And this is one of our animal ambassadors. His name is Moro and he is a male peregrine falcon. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some general information and then we'll talk about Mr. Morrow directly. Um, peregrine falcons are medium-sized raptors with about a three to four foot wingspan and a weight of about, about two pounds. So they're not very heavy, even though they're very muscular. They have hollow bones and then the rest of them, of course, are feathers. Um, there's little difference between the males and the females with regard to their coloring. They look very, very similar. The females in raptors are always a little larger than the males, however. 
they nest in on cliffs, in caves, and they make what's called a scrape. And it is literally, they scratch the rock and they ha lay their eggs. They do not build nests. Um, they usually lay two to four eggs and they are very resourceful. If they can't find a bare rock or a cliff, you may have seen uh, things where they will go to a high rise, a building in New York, for instance, and make their nest on a balcony. They also are starting to nest under human-made bridges. Uh, peregrine falcons uh, feed almost exclusively on birds they, um, that they catch in the air in mid-flight. Oh, he's showing you his wings. Lovely. They are seen in uh, spectacular dives. They are amazing at their flying. When they're flying normally, they range between 28 and 60 miles an hour. But when they're what's called a stoop, where they're diving from great heights to get their prey, they can reach speeds of over 225 miles an hour. They are the fastest animal on the planet. And they love speed. It's their favorite thing. Um, they will cut, catch everything from songbirds to herons to ducks. They have tremendous lift and they can pick up a heron or a duck without any trouble whatsoever. So. Uh, they also uh, were almost extinct. In uh, 1965, they were completely gone from the East Coast. That was because of our use of DDT. It did not necessarily kill them outright, but what happened is, is it thinned their eggshells. So when they would breed and the female would lay her eggs, she would go to brood them, hatch them, keep them warm. She'd sit on them and she'd crush them. The, the, the shells were so thin. So their population started plummeting and that's when they were gone from the East Coast. There were still uh, a pair, mating pair here on the Central Coast on Morro Rock and people came from all over to study these birds. Um, they had good food and uh, they were not subject to as much DDT. We have stopped, thank you, we have stopped using DDT here in the States. However, it's still being used south and they do migrate. Um, so sometimes we still get peregrines in with DDT in their system. Here though on the central coast, why would they migrate? It's amazing here. So they usually do stick around and I think that's part of why they can avoid any kind of contamination. Um, they are found on every continent except Antarctica and um, they generally keep the same coloration. Ah, oh, he's exercising his wings a bit. While he's doing that, you can see how pointed each individual feather is on his wings. Everything about this bird is built for speed, and that also gives him that rakish look to cut through the air. Also, if you look at his face now, he has a very strong orbital bone. It's this right here, and it's look, it helps like this, like a build cap. He hunts from very high up, and it cuts glare, and he can see better with that orbital bone. And he's got a little itch. Um, also, what helps him are these malar stripes on either side of or and under his eye. Those are very similar. They, those also cut glare. They're very similar to those uh, grease smudges that football players use also to cut glare. Um, he has a very large, strong beak, and he has a little notch in his beak, which I'll see if he'll show us right now. There it is. And what that does is that fits perfectly in the vertebrae of a bird that he's caught. I think this is something that's kind in nature because he grabs them, cut, breaks their neck, and that way they don't suffer. He will catch a bird in flight. He will dispatch it. He will take it if there's babies to the cave where um, the female is. He will make a call. She will come out, and this is fairly unique to them. She will fly straight at him, and then she'll flip over and fly upside down, and they do a talon to talon transfer. Of the, and then she can go back to those babies. The babies are almost as big as the male when they're born, so he kind of wants to stay away from that nest. He leaves that to the female. Um, and his main job is hunting. Uh, when she takes the uh, bird from him, the male, she'll set, give a cry 
and their cries very loud. And I think she's telling him to get back out there and get more food. The babies are always hungry. So then once the babies are fully feathered and the female doesn't have to sit on them to keep them warm, or actually they have full down, um, they will, can both go out and hunt for them. Um, and when they get their flight feathers, then the male and the female team up to teach them flight training and also how to hunt. They are incredible hunters. Um, they also have, the, you can see his feet are huge. So when they're making their very fast stoop, can get over 200 miles an hour, as I said, they come down head first, they hook at the bottom, they open up these big feet, and they slam into the prey animal, the bird. They send it in a spin. 90% of the time, they kill on impact, but they use that beak if they have to. They grab the bird, uh, and they take off. Um, they rarely drop an animal. Uh, if they do, they just zoom down and grab it again and keep going. They don't like to stop for much once they have speed. They also have, you can see this part of their wing here, it's very, very thick. That's how they, they're very, very muscular. And they, that's why they can pick up such big prey. Um, but you can see he has very long talons. And he also, if you can see on his left leg, there's a little gold band. That's a bird tag and uh, for band, it's a banding. And he was born and raised in captivity. Um, the way that they got peregrine falcons back from the brink of extinction is they uh, took their eggs, put them in an incubator, and then returned them to the nest. They also then kept some eggs and they bred in captivity. And that continues to this day. The populations are back up. They were taken off the endangered species list in August of 1999. So that's a wonderful success story. Um, they are back and they are spreading again. Our Morro Bay falcon, uh, falcons, the peregrines, have babies on the Catalina Islands, up to the Bay Area, and down to San Diego. So they've done a great job of repopulating and they're, they're off the endangered species now, list now. Um, it's we Pacific Wildlife Care wanted a peregrine falcon because even if you go out to Morro Rock to see them, uh, at, at those speeds you don't see much and you don't get to observe them this closely, which is really special. We feel really privileged to have him. Um, the other thing is that uh, he is banded. He's been raised by humans. The reason the falconer generously donated him to us is because he was tangled in a lure line as a young bird and would just fly away if they tried to hunt him. And then they spent their time chasing him. So um, he's going to be with us for the rest of his life. Once they imprint like this to humans, this is not normal behavior for a peregrine. They're very high strung birds. And uh, once they imprint to humans, uh, they can never be released. The other peregrines would know there's something off. They don't speak the language or they just don't act normally and they would kill a bird that had been raised by humans. So he's with us for life. He's lived with me. I am his handler and our education animals live with their handlers. He's lived with me uh, about eight years now. So um, he's very comfortable. He's very, very good at going out on presentations and letting people get to know him. So we hope he's with us for a very long time. I think that's everything I wanted to share with you today. Thank you so much for tuning in, and hopefully you'll get to see us in person in the very near future. Thanks so much.